Sounds okay to me, baby. This deal is so damn hot. Why come to us? Well, new around here. I don't know anybody else. You don't know me, buddy. Sure I do. You and Sonny both from the prestige job. Bullshit. What do you know about that? Shut up, you stupid fuck. I know about the prestige job. From Johnny Hanson. I don't think you know what you're messing with. Look, I was working at the prison hospital when Johnny Hanson checked out. You can call personnel. Yeah, is that so? Well, if you know so goddamn much about it, what are you going to trust me and Ray for, huh, baby? I can't do the Commodore alone. I need somebody to work the stash, and I need a skirt inside. Hey, that five million goes pretty good three ways. Yeah, that's a big job, but how do I know you know what you're doing? Hey, pal, I handled a few jobs before I was in the Navy. You can check that out, too. This is one time off for you. Think about it. I'll tell you when I tell you. What are you, some big shot? Go check him out. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Every time you go to a bar, the bar's got somebody in that thinks he's as tough as a nickel steak. But they all come to speed when they go Ray me. Now get this. We partners, we brothers, and we friends. My little brother was 15 years old. Think about that. You're waiting. You know. How about cutting heat? Oh, I get it. You want some kind of contest, huh? You're a real smart boy, ain't you? I guess maybe you'll have to kill me. It'll hurt if I do. Well. I finally ran into someone that likes to lay as rough as I do. Yeah, this must be your lucky night. And my bodies, they're not nice like me. Are we supposed to say thanks? You're not supposed to say nothing. Soldier. He hid behind the mask of his own face. We're working with him? Walking in the shadows. Thanks to a genetic abnormality, he was born with physical defects that all humanity consider totally disgusting. On the edge <laughs> of violence. I got something for you, boy! Till one day his world was shattered. It was just like a big brother to you. You just tell me who they are and where I can find them. You are in the lockdown ward at St. Matthew's Charity. I run a program that deals with reconstructive surgery. How would you like a new face? I will give you a new name and a chance at a new life. I know who you are and I know what you are. You look like a great guy, at least I think so. I'm not so sure that I'm what you want. I know what I want. What's the matter? Ready to be normal? But all he sees is the past. I saw them kill my best friend. Why don't you give me a little hint, baby? Help me remember who you are. He'll come to you. I'm gonna take him out big when the time gets right. You really think you're gonna get even with me? You got a shot at a better life. You can't just throw that away. I don't think you know what you're messing with. Sure, I do. Johnny Handsome. Hello, folks. Welcome back to Last Call of Torchies. Uh, it's been a minute, but people get busy, and here we are again to give you another installment of the Walter Hill oeuvre. Uh, Oeuvre is a good word. But with me, as mm -hmm. usual, tonight is uh, Lee Russell. How you doing, sir? I'm doing pretty good, man. Just had some, uh, you know, reconstructive surgery. So, uh, feeling pretty good about myself. Yeah. Man, oh, man. Cameron Scott, sir. How you doing, <laughs> sir? I'm doing great. I have not had a reconstructive surgery, and I feel terrible about myself. Oh. <laughs> no, not really. I feel good. I feel good, man. But but I'm sure you know uh, he can make us a, a chocolate version of ourselves if we really ask him to you know because everybody wants that <laughs> yeah that's that's some behind the scenes stuff you you know or you don't know about Cameron it's it's, it's fine though you know oh god he he brings the fudge <laughs> y'all in in literally in literal sense you know. oh okay oh, Jesus. <laughs> don't don't remind me man <laughs> come on man no it's fine it's better than making the donuts it's better than well yeah it depends on the donuts man I'm, I'm uh, 
I take the donuts over the fudge all day long. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Fattening stuff. That's fine, though. We're here tonight to discuss uh, Johnny Handsome from 1989. And we'll, uh, we'll throw you right into the, to the plot synopsis right now. After being double-crossed and thrown in jail, a deformed gangster gets a new face and rehabilitation, but his desire and re- his, his desire for revenge looms. I read that wrong right away because I'm stupid, apparently. Um, this has a, a bunch of newcomers to the, 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 the world of Walter Hill, and some of them never came back again, I don't think. But um, mm. we'll talk about that. Mickey Rourke uh, plays uh, our titular Johnny Handsome. Ellen Bar- Ellen Barkin looking looking fire with that teased hair and hoop earrings as as Sonny Boyd, um, Elizabeth McGovern as Donna Donna McCarty, um, Morgan Freeman uh, a couple years past Fast Black which me and yeah. immediately discussed on a other podcast, <laughs> <laughs> um, as Lieutenant uh, Drones there uh, the 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 police officer who's constantly on his ass. Playing a character who would not like Flash, uh, Fast Black at all. He would not like. No, he would not be a <laughs> no. fan. You know. Uh, Doctor Forrest Whitaker as Doctor uh, Stephen Rusher. Uh, the great Lance Henriksen. I, I can't say enough about this man. But he's. Oh my. He God. Brings, the, the lack of the lack of sleeves in this man's attire in this film. He ain't got time for sleeves, man. It's it's spectacular. Mm-hmm. You know. He wants to shut those guns. Yeah. He was pretty fucking fit in this movie, Hell man. Yeah, he was man. looking pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he was like in uh, Stone Cold shape at that point. Yeah. Uh, the late great Scott Wilson, looking young in this movie. Uh, almost didn't recognize him right away. Uh, Peter Jason shows up, of course. Um, David Graff shows up. Oh, Alan, Alan Graff shows up in this, of course. Um, those are your couple your couple um, uh, other ones that are in the Walter Hill oeuvre, if you Hill will. Regulars, yeah. I, I was I was looking in the cast. I was looking, where's Brian James? Where is he? Oh, he's not in this one. <laughs> Fuck. Not, he's in the next one, guys, so for spoilers yeah. for you guys. Um, but Blake Clark shows up for a hot second. I, I love that actor, so I'm happy to see him in this. This is um, directed by Walter Hill, written by, um, well, the novel is by John Goaty, uh, The Three Worlds of Johnny Handsome, and Ken Friedman wrote the screenplay. And, um, yeah, I, I, I dug this. It's a first time watch for me. And, um, oh, yeah. I, I, I'll kick it to Cameron first and ask him about his, his initial thoughts and whatever he wants to say about it. Uh, this is one of my favorites by Walter Hill. I love a good, a good uh, film noir, you know, and he didn't really dip his toe into that pond. He was usually, you know, kind of, you know, action flicks and, you know, westerns and whatnot. But I, I love a good film noir. And, you know, Say what you will about the man. He, he, he may be a mess, but uh, I love Mickey Rourke. He was one of my favorite actors for a long, long time. And, you know, Lance Henriksen just chewing up the scenery, going all sleeveless, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's a bold, bold decision, man. But I love him as Rafe. Uh, he's he's just great. And uh, everybody is really super in this movie. I mean, Ellen Barkin is just like, I mean, what can you say about Ellen Barkin that has already been said? I mean, she's fucking amazing and just stellar in this and uh because like she had the fight to get the role too from what i understand you know she had not really fight but she had to like convince uh or like uh had a little bit of a discussion with walter hill as to whether or not she should take the role she's like i want to play this role she's just a stone cold bitch and she wanted to play it so bad so i love that she's in this and morgan freeman kind of uh you know first time i really like took notice of him i was like 13 when this came out i rented it right when it first came out so this was a heavy renter for me i was a big fan of make your work back in the day so uh still am but you know but yeah it's, it's great it's got just the right amount of action and i totally forgot on this viewing going into it that scott wilson was in it as in mikey you know i couldn't mm. I, i'd totally forgotten about that and i met you know scott wilson he's an amazing guy he, he was just so fucking cool and yeah, I can't say enough cool things about this. And the Ry Cooter soundtrack, it it's the best Ry Cooter's ever done, it's, as far as I'm concerned. This and maybe Last Man Standing, you know, it's it's it, up there, right? Because like this is kind of a neo noir, but it's like a neo noir in the deep south kind of thing. So it's like it's got his twang, but at the same time, it's got his bluesy kind of thing going on. Right, right. Yeah, 
But yeah, I can't say enough good things. This is probably, I'd really have to sit and think about it, but probably a top three of my Walter Hill jams, I have to say. But yeah, yeah, can't say enough good things about it. Cool. Lee? Uh, first time watch for me as well. Uh, I didn't even know this one existed, honestly. The, this is just wow. totally new to me. Um, you were missing this, a gem, man. I am. Uh, this 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 is uh, hovering around my top five uh, for Walter Hill films because it was really surprised me. I was really taken back. Uh, really good neo noir, and, and Cameron's right. You know, he doesn't necessarily do noir all that often. But when he does dip into it, he does a really good job with it. Like, you know, I'm thinking specifically the driver. You get some of those yeah. vibes here, although this is a little bit more. Um, it's more like Southern Fried Noir. Yeah. And there, it's a little bit adjacent to Dark Man, I find, in a little bit a little bit of ways. Just, just with the whole face thing. Um, it, it's got that sort of sensationalist kind of thing that they would sometimes do in some 19. 19- 40s style noirs where you know there, there was some sort of gimmick with like one of the main characters or something you know um he'd have like some sort of mental disorder or, he, or he'd be scarred or something like that some sort of driving component to his motivations and the story as a whole um this this is pretty good though it, it's not as action heavy as hill tends to do it's it's been more of a slow burn, more of a slow pace, but at the same time, it moves pretty much as quick as any of his movies move. You know, like it it just shot by hour and a half. I was like, oh, it's it's over, okay, <laughs> uh, like like no fat on it at all. Just you know, a, a, just a kind of thing that is a testament to uh, his filmmaking, where he he basically just chops all the fat off of his films for the most part, and um, it goes by quick. Uh, like Cameron said, a bunch of great actors in this, great performances all up and down the line. Um, I, I think maybe if there is any detriment to this, uh, because he cuts so much fat off of this, that you know some of these characters don't necessarily get to breathe as much as I'd have liked, um, like the Forrest Whitaker character and the and the nun. Like they, they get they get their moments, but they don't necessarily get a lot to do necessarily. Um, I. I could watch more and more of Morgan Freeman in this movie if if you wanted to give it to me because uh, he's just wandering around and he's got that Morgan Freeman charm but at the same time he's kind of a cold-hearted cop who just he he knows deep down he's convinced that Johnny Handsome is still a, a a bad dude you know it's like you're ugly on the outside and you're ugly on the inside uh, he was so, right <laughs> yeah and he was right like uh it's just classic noir material where the bad guy can't kick the inner demons that he, that he's facing. Even if he's got a new face, even if he looks totally different, he, even if he looks like Mickey Rourke, who, you know, uh, p- some people I think would probably say, you know, when he, in the opening, when he's disfigured, they'd be like, Oh, that's a bit of a step too much. Like, you know, that makeup and everything. I'm like, no, I mean, if you, if you Google face disfigurement, like instantly you'll get tons of images of people who look way fucking worse than he does in this film. And uh, he's almost and the, got like an elephant man. Yeah, he really does. Look. Yeah. He's, he's got a cleft palate and he's got an elephant man kind of thing going on at the same time. And I mean, if anything, the least believable thing is the fact that the uh, reconstructive surgery made him look like peak Mickey Rourke, where he still had his, you know, his pretty boy face. <laughs> Because, you know, once he gets out of the surgery, um, he has, you know, he has a scar on his forehead and he's still got the scar from the cleft palate. But that's it. You know, they they give him new teeth and everything. Um, But, you know, people who have like massive reconstruction like he had, they, they end up, you know, they look more normal, but they don't necessarily look normal normal uh, you know i'm not trying to try to be offensive in saying that or anything like you know i'm not saying that people with disfigurement are not normal but you know they don't they don't have like a typical necessarily typical human look to them with even with the reconstruction necessarily like, yeah they always tend to look augmented of, to to an extent yeah whereas you know mickey rourke he's got that scar on his head and it quickly diminishes to like the Harry Potter lightning bolt on the, in the middle of his head, you know. Um, 
but yeah, well, we'll get more into it. I, I feel like I've, I'm over talking here a little bit. So, uh, throw over to Gary. No, that is his revenge bolt where he, you know, it turns on and he wants to get revenge with, you know, for, yeah, killing his friend or whatnot. <laughs> yeah. You see this? I'm getting angry now, brother. Come on now. You know. <laughs> you wouldn't like me when I'm angry. You wouldn't like when my, 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 uh, my, my scar bolt is getting all crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I dug this one too. Like I said, first time watch, I was aware it was a thing. I wasn't aware it was a Walter Hill thing, but I was seeing this like on the video shelf and ne- never, never picked it up. Thinking, thinking nothing of it, because uh, to, to be fair, when I, when I was young, uh, Mickey Rourke films were kind of a naughty thing in my house, because because of nine, oh, yeah. nine and a half weeks uh, was the thing. And um, bo- bo- Body Heat and Nine and a Half Weeks, both like very much in tune with kind of the sleazy sweaty sexy crime shit that's going on in this film right yeah for sure yeah yeah like like you guys said this has that, that awesome noir feel to it and it's not something you see a lot of walter hill and i i i, I dug it all the way it, it it was accented very well by the score and um it, like I said, it moves at a pace where, where you know i i, I think I, I know you needed the 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 whole thing with the the facial reconstruction thing to, to move the plot along but mm-hmm Th- that going a little a little long for me, and the love interest feeling kind of forced is is like the only real weak spots in this film for me. Bes- besides that, is it's pretty much, you know, it didn't need a lot of like chases and stuff. It didn't need a lot of like you know big. It had like the big action set pieces like in the beginning where they're robbing the coin store, right. and you know the the end where oh, <laughs> I will say, Lance Henriksen. Gives gives the beating of his life to Mickey Rourke in this movie. He just mm-hmm. beating the and he's shit. He's loving every moment of it. Loving every, every moment. moment of it. Yeah, and cuts his face, you know, and all kinds of crazy stuff. Now, as far as the the um, his disfigurement, I, I I like that they 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 got into his background a little bit because you, you start to think that he has like a Rocky Dennis thing going on because mm-hmm. Rocky Dennis's mm-hmm. mother was addicted to drugs and that's why. He was the way he was, so it kind of has a kind of connection there for me because I've, I've seen I've seen the movie Mask about I don't even know it was on it was on Showtime so much back in the day that uh, I, I probably watched it at least twenty times and probably twenty times past that and um, yeah it's it's Sam Elliott man that's, that's a good Sam Elliott yeah that's the image that I see you know the man style um, <laughs> but if you look at look at pictures of the real um, Rocky Dennis. He was much, much worse, and, and I'm, I'm not saying he, he he looks he looks god awful, but his dis- disfigurement was much worse than it was in the movie. Right. I guess he had to like see the Eric Stoltz the, the Eric Stoltzness of his face, uh, so you can recognize that's Eric Stoltz. But um, <laughs> uh, I can talk about the movie probably for another 45 minutes, but I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> th- this one's really great, though. I mean, great, great character actors all over. Uh, y- you see. Um, Morgan Freeman, you know, as as a budding, you know, playing this character, because he 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 plays us in like a long a spider and stuff like that. There's this this mm. professional law man. He 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 plays the role. He plays the role well, and it sets it up for all the stuff that you would get later. There's depth to his performance too. That's not necessarily in the script. Oh, yeah. like, it it, t- it touches upon it, but like he's playing, you know, a professional. Uh, black detective who's working in um well working in you know louisiana and there there is a moment where you know he has conflict with some other cops from another parish or whatever and they're like we don't need you around here it's like oh no i'm well aware you don't need me around here right (laughs) you you don't need my type around here white boy basically is what he's saying like like it, it definitely touches upon those sort of things and like there's also the added depth of you know uh the system to some degree doesn't seem like it's uh tuned towards letting people rehabilitate uh where you know um how he's constantly hounding Johnny Handsome and saying you're going to go back to prison or you're going to uh commit another crime you're going to break your parole that kind of thing like uh it it seems like it's you know just a little bit winking you know at at that kind of uh thought it, but it doesn't really um doesn't really delve deep into like the whole you know uh institutionalized prison system in America and how 
prisoners are not necessarily rehabilitated. They're just, you know, punished and then let go. back on the street. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he does everything but like drive Johnny Hansen to a bank and say, here, please rob it. Mm hmm. I mean, the way he's chasing him and the way he talks about him, you think he, like, murdered, like, 17 women and raped four, four children or something. Like, he's, like, right. the, the worst criminal on the planet. But the, the way, the way you know, his upbringing was, he was he was angry as, as a young man because of his disfigurement. And mm. he brings up that story about, you know, him wearing a Halloween mask as a kid. And then the kid pulls it off and he, he beats the shit out of that kid. That, that seems like more of, of Johnny, Johnny Hansen's speed is, like, you know, don't, don't cross me or I'll beat the shit out of you or the p petty, petty robberies and stuff like that. It's just, it's, it doesn't seem like he's like a truly like violent, hardened criminal, but they, the way he's, the way he's talking about him. Yeah. Like he, like you push him and, he, and he'll push back, but he's not necessarily a bad guy. Like he does try to protect Elizabeth McGovern, McGovern. And I agree with you, Gary, um, I forgot to mention that honestly is also the other little weak spot in this film. It's like her yeah. character just seems like a formulaic love interest rather than like something that's really part of the plot that really needs to be there. Like she didn't need to be taken hostage at the end by Rafe and Sonny, you know, like they easily could have had that standoff in the, in the cemetery with, without her. Um, but she, you know, it's more movie, formulaic where oh you have to have the sympathetic girl who sees the the inner goodness of our uh anti-hero you know and and it's going to try to save him and try to change him that that's just a very classic uh noir trope that uh rears its head here uh but you know for what it's worth elizabeth governs really cute and uh the, the person using the, the water spritzer bottle on her naked back for the love scene was going overboard with it because <laughs> the, the beads of sweat that that's supposed to be, it's like, whoa, you might want to change those sheets. Uh, I'm just saying, but, you know. I, th I thought during the love scene was probably one of the saddest parts because, like, she's talking about, oh, you know what I love the most about your face? Your eyes. And it's just like, wah, wah. Like, right. He can't even. Because she, she doesn't know yet that he was, you know, disfigured. So yeah, and she's talking about she, you know, it, it just it's a nice little piece of subtext, you know. It's just like she's talking about the real him that she loves. She's not talking about the outside appearance because the outside appearance is like peak Mickey Rourke, who's fucking handsome as fuck. Yeah, because at that point she has she has inklings of his past, and she even like towards mm -hmm. the end of the movie she she really doesn't know what his past is, just what. You know, Morgan Freeman teases to her, like, well, I, I, I see what you did there, baby, and blah, 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 yeah. blah, 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 and, you know, and um, all this stuff, and until she gets abducted by Rafe and, and his lady, she doesn't know the, the, the uh, I guess, the the risk of, of being with old Johnny Handsome there until mm -hmm. she gets she gets kidnapped and taken away by it, which I thought was the guy from Friday the 13th Part 3, but I am I am mistaken. Uh, their, their driver when they when they rob the right the, the, he, he does look like him right yeah he does yeah I thought, yeah, that, I yeah, thought yeah. it was that totally. guy <laughs> but um yeah she doesn't really know anything and the whole idea of like just throwing that in at the end I mean they could easily just uh, exit her out of the movie altogether and broke into his apartment where they they may, they may find out where he lived and you'll be like yep that's the guy we see we see the this figureman pictures we we recognize that guy and. Yeah, they, they got fucked over. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, she she looks at those pictures and goes, wait a second, this is 2023 Mickey Rourke. How did you get <laughs> pictures of him? You know what, I was gonna, travel I, I was gonna mention that, that it's kind of like reverse osmosis or some shit, you know, where <laughs> yeah. he, he, uh, if you guys don't know why Mickey looks the way he does, he was a boxer uh, after he became an actor. Or before that, too, I believe. Yeah, like he kept going back to boxing. And he got busted up and had a box surgery. That's why he looks the way he does, you know. Yeah. Um, but this is the exact opposite, which is very strange. And, and, and uh, it kind of, like, predicted that, I guess. I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. So I do I do have to stop and say something here. Go for it. And, and, and this, you know, Walter, I know you're listening. Dude, why is there no torchies here? Half there, there's there's a central piece of this plot in the opening that revolves around a fucking bar, 
because the whole idea is like we're gonna rob this place and get this money from this coin shop and we're gonna use that to finance my bar and then they have the bar and it's the fucking harp or whatever like dude yeah no Rafe, torchies yeah Rafe's bar has to be a, a regional torchies there Walter and uh Mm-hmm. We we, we dedicated we it dedicated the show name to it, and we uh, we're going through the oeuvre of your movies, and you know what? Our friend Peter made us look all cartoony for you, and it's amazing, yeah. you know. But um, it, it, it's it's a nudie bar and everything. It's got neon signs in there. It's a nudie bar. Why is this not Torchies? It makes no sense. It's not. It's not a bunch of fucking. Irish people who, you know, wear green on St. Paddy's Day to pretend they're more Irish than they are, sitting around drinking pints of Guinness. It's a bunch of fucking bikers and cowboys and other assorted people in there fucking doing drugs and watching the fucking titty dancers. So it's like, you really dropped the ball, Walter. That's all I got to tell you, man. Yeah, I mean, there's whiskey, there's titties, there's neon, that should have been torchies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a uh, c- couple quick things here. Uh, people up for the role. Uh, Al Pacino was considered. Richard Gere and Willem Dafoe. Um, but yeah, turned uh, turned down the part. Originally announced that Richard Gere would star on the film. Peter Berdricker by Howard Becker, whoever that is. I have to look that up. And then Mickey Rourke was cast in the lead role of Walter Hill with, with Walter Hill directing because he couldn't find a studio to make this movie. So he wasn't going to make it until it, it happened, obviously. Yeah, it, it, well, it's a, it's a hard sell too, like right? Because he and the, the way he originally wanted to make it, he wanted to do it black and white, and he wanted to really make it like a noir. And I guess that ran into some problems for him. And then like the whole idea that like, oh, our lead is going to be really ugly for the first like thirty minutes of the film, <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, let's say this: the guy who's known for being a pretty boy, at least at the time, and like at this make point, him yeah, horribly ugly. Mm-hmm. But man, um. Uh, fucking Willem Dafoe. That as much as he he could have been a Rafe, too. Like he, you could have easily had him as Rafe as well. Like I I feel like he would have fit right into that fucking role too if if they had wanted to like put him there. But you know like I am not gonna I am not gonna jettison Lance Hendrickson because no. <laughs> he's fucking awesome in this. Like like he's the reason to show up for this movie. Mm-hmm. And pretty much I mean like well, there's many reasons to show up in this movie, but like Lance Hendrickson is the MVP. And, and and Ellen Barkin is just like given this superb performance of this like she's not even she's not even a femme fatale she's like a femme fatale on meth or something like she is crazy like she is just a nasty piece of work like these are two of Walter Hill's best on screen villains oh yeah I mean the, oh. p- picture this guys you know Ellen Barkin in all leather. With tease blonde hair and hoop earrings. It, it does it mm-hmm. for me. I don't know about you guys, you know, but it does yeah, it for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and to answer your question, uh, Gary, Harold Becker, I looked up while we were talking. He directed City Hall. He directed Mercury Rising with Bruce okay. Willis and Sea of Love also with Ellen Barkin. And oh, Pacino. okay. That makes sense. Sea of Love, that that would be a film that you could pair with this as a double feature. And surprisingly enough, he directed like a half dozen Madonna videos. I don't know what that's about, but you know, do what well, you do. You find I work mean, where you can get it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, Mickey Rourke was a pretty boy, you know, for a lot of films. You, you look at the, the stuff that he made before this, you know, diner, Pope of Greenwich village, village. I'm sorry. I said that wrong. Yeah. You know, stuff mm-hmm. like that. And, yeah, he was went, he even he, Angel Heart before this one? I think so. He was eighty seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, this, yeah, th- this is this is peak Rourke, right? Like this is this is where he's a big star, and he's probably like literally the most handsome star in Hollywood at the time, kind of thing. And it's just like so. Th- this is kind of an interesting part for him because even though you know he does get the facial reconstruction where he looks like Mickey Rourke, he's still kind of uglied up a little bit, mm-hmm. you know outside of his usual image so uh to, to angel hearts credit though it's a great film and i i love it but the first time i saw it the the fact that robert de niro's cave was, name was lou cypher uh, this, yeah this is some fucking bullshit right here <laughs> that's right <laughs> i mean you know message hello <laughs> i mean 
if I saw that, I'd be like, okay, this guy's really eccentric. Like he's he's fucking around, you know. Like you know, I I, I could I could kind of let it slide, but yeah, it it really doesn't work. It's like, film. hey, what's his name? A Lucard, really now? Okay, yeah. You know. <laughs> like like he he, he, he could have literally called himself like you know anything that's even a little bit close, but a little bit more normal. Like, hey, like a Damien. Damien uh, Fire or something like that, or some <laughs> stupid thing like that. It's a little less goofy, but you know. Oh my gosh. Yeah, one of the biggest crimes this film commits is killing off Scott Wilson's early, because he's pretty great for what time you get with him, but mm-hmm. without him getting killed, you wouldn't have the revenge effect of the movie. So. Ah, uh, and I, I love, I love yeah. how, uh, <laughs> I love how Walter Hill uh, could. Uh, sort of, you know, gives us the emotional heart because we got Mickey Rourke looking at the photo of him with with, with Scott Wilson, and then but it's cut to uh, inside the bar with the topless dancer. It keeps cutting back to him looking at the photo or the looking at the photo, and then it looks to like a naked ass gyrating in the screen. It's like, what am I supposed to think about this? Like, <laughs> am I supposed to feel sad for him and like get behind his revenge, or am I supposed to look at these titties all of a sudden that are in right. my face? Am I supposed to be titillated or mm. sad? Hey, I, I think that he's had really fond memories of watching Jack bring titties and ass with his friend, and you know he just keeps maybe. thinking about it. You know, That's a, maybe yeah, maybe because yeah, because Scott Wilson took him to his first titty bar. I knows? feel like he probably did because you know the 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 little time we do get with them, like it's pretty obvious he treats. Uh, Johnny as a real person, you know, as a normal person, like he doesn't, he doesn't look at him as disfigured. He, he just treats him as a friend and like kind of a son, really like our younger brother at the very least, like kind of thing. I kind of feel like, like Scott Wilson's character was the only one who saw Johnny that way. And that's why he was so close to him. He's like, here's the one guy that, you know, treated me as an equal and just treated me as a human being where everybody looked at me and just went, ew. Mm Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah. One one thing I loved about the whole the whole robbery scene at the beginning is the setup of them blowing up the cars, and then you know after after our friend Scott Wilson gets shot, their their other guy on their squad gets shot in the back of the neck. I don't see that too often yeah. in the movies, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it didn't come out the other side either, so it's just like lodged in the dude's neck. It's like, oh, yeah, he, he might have been too, might, might have took a while for him to die. You know, <laughs> I don't mm-hmm. even know. It just uh. The fact they shot in the back of the neck, I was like, "Well, that's something you don't see every day." That's a, yeah, that's I, honestly, I think that's a, I think that's the first time I've ever seen that on screen. <laughs> but yeah, I, I had a good time with this one, and um, it's 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 sad, it's exciting, you know, and it moves at a great pace. Like like you guys said, it's like ninety minutes long, so it, there's not a lot of, not a lot of meat on the bones to say, "Hey, let's slow it down." With this, hey, let's let's slow it down with that. It's like, no, he's. He orchestrates, you know, this robbery so he can get in crew, get in tight with that crew. They don't know who he is, and he he rightfully fucks them over. So there, there's uh, mm-hmm. there's that. He said the the love interest thing was just kind of thrown in there, in my opinion. It's, 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 yeah, that was, this seemed a little bit fluff, but it was also kind of. I didn't think they were trying to throw Johnny in like a redemption arc. Like, is he going to make it? Is he going to end up all right? Like, and we all know he's not. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but uh, like they could have cut out that and gave us five extra minutes of like Morgan Freeman, you know, just chewing up the scenery or Lance Henderson, and I'd have been just equally happy. <laughs> Lance, mm-hmm. Lance Henderson working the free weights with that uh, that that cut off cowboy shirt on. Come on now, you know, <laughs> J- just working on the working on them guns. Yeah, and then they don't give us like there. There's that uh, character who's going to launder the money for Johnny Handsome. He's like a he's like a city councilor or something like that. Um, I kind of wanted more of him too because he just kind of comes out of nowhere in the film. Like they he he like Johnny Hansen meets up with him. I hear you launder money, and then there's like another scene with him where he's like, "Oh, you're actually Johnny Hansen, and you're pulling a you know you're pulling a double cross on these guys. That's pretty sweet. I like it. Feels like he should have had a little bit more to do because he feels like a guy who's kind of like moving and shaking behind the scenes and sort of the, the underworld of the city. Um, and it, it ends up, he's just, you know, uh, fucking Morgan Freeman catches him and goes, well, I know what you've been up to. Now you're going to spill the beans on everything that's going down or, you know, kind of thing. But right. Uh, right. Yeah. It, it feels like, again, it, it just feels like uh, Walter Hill cut so much fat off of this film that some of that stuff probably was there, but it was probably lost just for the sake of like 
making this really breezy, which it really is really breezy. Like, it doesn't even feel like 90 minutes. It feels like 70 minutes. Yeah, and it's not, like, as we've already said, it's not action-packed. You know, mm-hmm. It has action where it's needed, but it, it moves at such a brisk pace. It's like, it just yeah. really moves quick. And one thing I wanted to touch base on, because while it's fresh in my head, is, like, I as, as sad as the ending is, I love how it comes to be. Like when he's mm-hmm. he's there and he's like all of a sudden his speech impediment comes back, right? You know, and is this like and he starts you know to, to to stutter, and you know and this, what was his final lines? I think it was it was how do I look? Yeah, it's just like fuck, oh, like fuck. Talk about a you know it's like not a gut punch. That's a kick in the nuts, man. Yeah, yeah. No, it's really good, really really good. Another f- fun gun thing, I guess. A fun gun thing. Like, yeah, he really grown for it, you know, in the graveyard scene where he's just sticking that shotgun barrel in her neck. Like, yeah, mm. you just want to blow that head clean off, don't you? Just, just from, from the neck, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, no, Sonny and Rafe don't give a fuck. Like, <laughs> they, they they don't like each other. They don't like anybody else. They They are just pure psychopathic fucking criminals who are just... <laughs> out for each other or or for themselves I should say and uh, I'm actually kind of surprised that after the initial heist that they actually stayed together you kind of figure one of them would have double crossed the other way beforehand oh, <laughs> in, oh. in... Give oh, cause, time. Cause, cause, give a little yeah, bit of time because yeah, Rafe's paranoia is a character in this movie I think all by mm-hmm. himself you know he don't trust nobody <laughs> yeah um, like, but, like, like, even when he has no cause to double cross somebody, he's like, "Yeah, we're gonna pull the job, then I'm gonna double cross him right away." Like, you know, like, okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I'll give it to hit it to Cameron next. Uh, anything else like to say about the film uh, before we close it out? Uh you know, I know we re- don't really do ratings, but this is a ten out of ten. I, I gotta say it. it. It's it's a beautifully made film. It's sad. It's depressing, but that's what it's set out to be. And the book is actually really good. The Three Worlds of Johnny Handsome. I, I sought it out in the 90s when I could finally, like, find a copy because I think it came out, like, 1970, 71, 72 or something like that. Hmm. But I hunted down. Good book. Uh, bears very little resemblance to, to the movie. You know, I mean, there's a lot of differences. You know, of course there is. You know, there's – yeah, that happens with books, translations mm-hmm. and movies. But it, uh, I have to recommend that to our listeners if, you, if you're the reading type. Seek, seek the book out if you can find it. It's long out of print, but it's really good. But uh, yeah, t- t- tune into this movie. I mean, it's it's classic Walter Hill. It's underappreciated Walter Hill, and it's Mickey Rourke in his prime. And Lance Henderson's never been better. Ellen Barkin's really never been better, except maybe in that la- last episode of Poker Face that came out like two weeks ago. She was dynamite in that but mm. uh the really only character in this movie that's really kind of wasted is forrest whitaker they don't really give him much to do i feel like he was this kind of textbook but mm. uh yeah this it's actor's master's class in this movie it's, it's just fucking phenomenal and just this is a shame that you know not enough people have seen this i'm kind of surprised the two of you had never seen this one before i'm like i'm like shocked but i'm happy you guys both liked it though the like, like I said, like I've already said a million times over, I can't say enough good things about this movie. Cool. Lee? Uh, absolutely loved it. This is, like, up there. Maybe, maybe not quite as good as Extreme Prejudice, but, like, up there is, like, far as stuff I'd never heard of from Walter Hill or never seen. Um, it's It blew me away. I was just it, – it's just one of those, like, you, you walk into this first-time watch of something and you don't know quite what to expect and – Walter Hill fucking kills it, and it, it's just very – I just feel like it's very unappreciated and very overlooked, and um, that's really unfortunate Like because Walter Hill's just, like, churning away these, like, really interesting uh, action and crime films, you know, in the late 80s that a lot of people just kind of overlook, and it sucks. Like, it, I, I think it's just, you know, people go back to – what they consider like his, his key films, like the driver and the warriors and hard times and stuff like that. And they just kind of forget about his other stuff. And this is a guy who was still knocking out bangers this later in his career. Uh, and it's fucking great. It, it's really good. People should be checking this one out. Uh, it, there's like just top to bottom, start to finish. It It's entertaining. It's uh, got a bunch of great actors in it. 
it's got some surprising violence and surprising character moments. And, uh, you know, it's Walter Hill, like, quietly swinging for the fences, I'd say. Like, again, the slower pace and everything. But, like, he's doing some really interesting stuff in this. And uh, I really liked it. Yeah, I'm right there with you guys. I, I dug quite a bit myself. You guys can tell by the review. Um, uh, if you want to find this one, you can find it on DVD. And uh, I think in the States, I just saw that there's a double Blu-ray with this and Angel Heart on it. So I guess like a Mickey, oh, Mickey Rourke double feature. Uh, that's uh, that's a good pairing. I like that. I'm not sure what the yeah. quality is. I couldn't tell you. But um, because <laughs> yeah. I know Angel Heart has a better Blu-ray out, I think, than, than that one, I think, by now in the States. I, I think it does. I, I could be wrong about that. Um, but yeah, good good, good times uh, all around. Yeah, digital, too. I'm sorry. I, that, that's how I own this on digital. And, um, yeah, check it out. Uh, we've been on a while, so I'm going to tell you guys to push your stuff. Cameron, what you got coming up, sir? Well, that's churning out show after show on Cinema Degeneration. We're going to be doing an Albert Pune uh, Appreciation Month, starting recording uh, tomorrow is the first episode I'm recording, doing that cyborg. And uh, Lee and I are going to be doing uh, Mean Guns uh, but Monday. Okay. And then you and I, uh, you and I uh, Gary, will be doing, uh, what's it, uh, Brain Smasher here soon. Mm. And so we're doing a couple of them. But yeah, that's pretty much the big thing I got on my plate is uh, trying to get the, the Albert Pion episodes recorded and getting some new uh, theme music recorded by a co-worker friend of mine. So cool. nice. looking looking forward to that. His name's Paul Now. He's a young kid that I work with and very talented, but uh, he's working on some new theme music for me. Cool. So yeah, but yeah, you can look for those to start coming out uh, about mid-March. Amazing. Lee, what about you, brother? Uh, they must be destroyed on site, tmbdos.podbean.com. Uh, we're a little up in the air on what we're doing quite next. Uh, recent stuff that we've put out, we did Clash of the Titans, which was a lot of fun to do. Um, and one of my, uh, my, my latest Blood on the Tracks episode, where I, I take a look at uh, soundtracks and scores from films, I did another episode on a, a new sort of series I started at the end of last year where I'm looking at uh, unreleased or rejected scores for films. Mm. Um, so uh, that's been uh, very fun to sort of research and go through and, and find stuff for. And uh, smaller playlists, but in general, pretty much the same length shows as I usually do. I try to keep that show around an hour or whatever, but um, yeah. Uh, we're just kind of doing what we're doing. Uh, like I said, uh, near future, a little bit up in the air that we got a, like a Raquel Welch, uh, tribute show, sort of like, you know, we're stoking the coals for that a little bit and, uh, we'll, we'll eventually get that done sometime this month. And I'm trying to get put together this month as well. Uh, a show with uh, my friends from the grind bin podcast, uh, Mike and Bobby, where we'll be covering um, Little Rita of the West, which is a spaghetti western, uh, fe- comedy spaghetti western, uh, featuring a uh, Italian pop star from the 1960s, uh, Rita Pavoni, who is amazing. Cool, yeah, you know where to find all my stuff on the Butcher Shop feed. Uh, this show, two drink minimum commentaries, Burry for Springwood, and, and the Sim Beef Podcast, respectively. All can be found on Legion Podcast as well. Um, next up, me and Iris are going to be doing, also doing, uh, Raquel Welch and, uh, Stella Stevens pairing, uh, those two together, actually. Uh, we'll let you know what that is when it comes to that. Once Suzanne comes back from vacation, we'll be doing the Where So Horny episode. We're doing the Howling and Sleepwalkers on that episode. So it should be a nice. good, good horny old time with, with the <laughs> dog people and the cat people. So, um. Horny and hairy. Horny mm-hmm. and hairy. That's right, you know. For, for, from what I understand, uh, this is a spoiler for the show, uh, Brian Krause really, literally gets it in with Alice Krieg in that lovemaking scene, so... Oh, it, really? Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> she told him to go for it, apparently. I'm like, okay, Borg Queen, I'll, I'll take that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it was consensual. I'd people. go for it. Yes. Um, two drink minimum two, 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 commentaries... Rock Roll Nightmare is still on the way. We haven't recorded it yet, but it's, it's coming uh, sooner rather than later. Nice. Um, up next on this show, though, on uh, the next in the Walter Hill line of films, 
we're revisiting uh old old um the the, the world of forty eight hours. I'm sorry, Jack Cates and um. What's what's Eddie Murphy's character's name again? I'm so stupid here. Uh, Reggie, Reggie, Hammond. Hammond. Re- Reggie Hammond. Yeah, we're re- re- revisiting those guys uh, along with Andrew Divoff and Brian James comes back and in a really forced role. We'll talk about that when we get to it. But I like a lot of other things about this movie. Another 48 Hours is coming up next on this show. By your Patreon feed, we are going to be t- discussing Mr. Sardonicus to go with this, uh, this whole disfigurement thing. Um... Mm. William Castle's film about a guy who gets a bad case of fright and is disfigured forever and tortures women and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, oh very <laughs> soon for us you'll be hearing that very soon for you let's put it that way but uh, this has been Last Call of Torchies and uh, we'll see y'all next time